Well, congregation, let's uh, open up our Bibles and let's turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, uh, verses 16 through 24. Uh, Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 24. This is the 50th uh, sermon in our series in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 24. This is the uh, public reading of God's holy word. Give careful and reverent attention to it. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept, our, to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with, cord, beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Amen. The sentence of reading of God's holy word. Uh, well, today is the second of three conversions that we find in Acts chapter 16. Last week, uh, we saw the beautiful expanse of grace and mercy of God. How it went from this Gentile woman, including this Gentile woman, Lydia, to today as we see this slave girl receiving the grace of Jesus Christ. The power of Christ saving grace as both Savior and Lord extended to Lydia and now to her. In fact, the famed biblical scholar F.F. F. Bruce makes this very point in his commentary. He explains that Luke made an intentional contrast between these two females. As he puts it, in order to show how the saving name of Jesus proved its power in the lives of the most diverse types. But there's more to this story. And that's why we read all the way to verse 24. It's not just that Jesus comes to you as Savior. He comes to you also as Lord. And this really gets flushed out for us in the second half of today's story. With the response of the slave owners and the people in the streets, the townspeople, we really begin to see this rejection of Jesus as Lord. And so let me ask you this question, and you can think about this question throughout today's sermon. How do you respond when God's grace, when God's saving grace comes to you not only as Savior, but confronts you and your allegiances to Him? Yes, He is your Savior, but does it show that He is also your Lord? And so as we think about this, Jesus as both my Savior and my Lord. Let's look at today's passage. Well, who exactly is this slave girl, right? What is she? Who is she? The NIV in verse 16 says that she is a female slave. But understand, this is too broad a term. And the ESV, probably what you have and what I read from, uh, the ESV does a very good job of translating this a phrase into uh, explaining the Greek that she is probably somewhere between 10 to 14 years and so it says she is a slave girl. She's nothing more than a child. She's just a child. She's a girl. 
a child and yet a slave. She's enslaved to these adult grown men. She's enslaved to their whim. She's enslaved to their greed, to their abuse of taking advantage of her. You see, these slave owners take her around different places and different towns. And what they would do is set her up, set her up, and then use her, use her and her predictions of the future in exchange for money, hence the language of fortune-telling. See, this was a very common and widely accepted practice these grown adult men taking advantage of these young girls to be used for their illicit gain. And yet we see that there's a double enslavement here. Not only is she enslaved to these abusive grown adults, but we also see that she is enslaved in another way. And in your translations it says a spirit of divination. But literally in the Greek it says a spirit of Python. She's enslaved to the spirit of Python. What in the world is a spirit of Python? Well, see, there's this mythology during this Greek and Roman time, and the mythology stated that there was a huge serpent who guarded the center of the earth, this oracle, right, this oracle that told the future. And what happened was Zeus the king of all the Greek gods, of all the Greek Romans, what Zeus sent his son, Apollo, to go and defeat this python servant. And so Apollo overcomes this python serpent, and what he does is he controls the future. And so the idea then of being possessed by the spirit of python was that python was now speaking through you, or Apollo would be speaking through you because he conquered Python. And in exchange, you would give money to these people. See, this is, again, another way to understand uh, fortune tellers, right? People desiring to have their palms read and to be told their future. But what's interesting is that uh, these palm readers, so to speak, these fortune tellers, uh, these people who are possessed by the spirit of Python, what they would do is they would also do this in a variety of voices. And as a result, there was another word that was often used to describe them. They were called ventriloquists. You see, just as the spirit of Python would be speaking through you, right, as a ventriloquist would use a dummy and speak to the audience through this dummy, Apollo, or, or the spirit of Python, would speak through these uh, people in order to tell them their future. Hence, the spirit of divination. You might, in fact, as they did so, with a deep voice. And so here you have this young girl, this 10 to 14-year-old young girl, and suddenly you have this, hey, with this deep male voice talking. And perhaps you even have uh, in the back of your mind uh, the movie Exorcist, with uh, that young girl saying, what an excellent day for an exorcism. Right? Crowds of people would come to these fortune tellers to hear their future. They would hear what the spirit of Python, Paula, would have to tell them. Now, this slave girl, you understand, was following Paul and Silas throughout the city, throughout the town, while they were preaching the gospel. And for days, she's crying out. Now, that language, again, crying out, it's more like shrieking out, right? She's yelling at the top of her voice and yelling, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. <coughs> it's this harsh, loud, piercing noise uh, and, and that all the people are hearing. Again, can you imagine this? As Paul and Silas are trying to preach the gospel to these people, to these uh, townspeople, the girl in the background is shrieking this message. What's amazing is that she's shrieking. They're proclaiming the message of salvation. 
She sounds like an evangelist. She sounds like she's part of the team. And yet, how many times in the Gospels did you hear uh, Jesus, despite uh, someone who was possessed, Jesus rebuking them? Even if they said true things, yet Jesus would rebuke them. And we have that throughout the Gospels, for instance, in Mark chapter 5. Now, what about Paul? What's Paul's reaction to all of this? Well, it's really interesting, isn't it, how it says he's annoyed, right? Now, you hear this, that Paul got annoyed from this. How many of you, when you hear this, kind of cringe a little bit? Right? An apostle got annoyed? Is that, is that allowable? Is that permissible? Can an apostle get annoyed by something like this? A couple commentators have explained that this shows, in fact, how uh, Paul, it, it shows a human side of Paul. And it shows that it doesn't put Paul in the greatest of light. And in this way, it's not some exaggerated legend. It's not some fairy tale, which is why C.S. Lewis, also commenting, explains that he says this, I have been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends, and myths all my life. I know what they are like. I know none of them are like this. See, the point is, Luke could have written here in Acts 16, he could have made Paul look heroic. He could have made Paul look compassionate. He could have made Paul look really good here. Instead, he writes what he sees, and Paul was visibly agitated by this whole scene. Right? Why is Paul agitated? Why is Paul annoyed by all of this? Well, here's the problem. Paul knows that Satan is trying to ruin the missionary's work in Philippi. See, remember that no one at this time understood what Christianity was. They weren't aware of it. Right? These Gentile crowds, they don't know that Jesus is the King of kings, Lord of lords. They don't know who this Jesus is, let alone the entire Old Testament history. They have no knowledge of who Jesus is. They don't know who these Christian missionaries are, right? As far as they're concerned, as far as we're concerned, first century Gentiles would have received the slave girl's message as no different from Paul's and proclaiming salvation through Zeus and Apollos. Paul's preaching in their minds would have been indistinguishable. And this is what put, would have put the gospel at risk. Also, think of this. Given how incredibly wicked it was to enslave this young girl, to use her like this for their illicit greed, the gospel of Jesus Christ would wrongly have been associated with this kind of evil. And this is something that the missionaries needed to distance themselves from this evil work. So Paul calls upon the name of Christ and frees her. The power of Jesus' name casts out the demon at work through the girl, masterfully crushing the serpent. The girl is delivered. And like the demoniac in Mark 5, 15, she too is suddenly in her right mind following an encounter with Jesus Christ. Like the demoniac in Mark 5, we see and can presume that she too follows Jesus Christ after having been delivered. A dramatic deliverance, a dramatic conversion, an electrifying experience that we see here. The absolute power of Jesus Christ, the absolute power of the gospel overcoming such evil is on display for us in this passage. Contrast this conversion with the conversion that we described last week with Lydia. Lydia is wealthy, the slave girl. Lydia is a community, or Lydia is a member, a community member of the utmost standing, the slave girl, an exploited teen. Lydia, religious, moral, 
the slave girl, the tormented bottom feeder of society. Lydia comes to faith through a quiet time of Bible study. The slave girl transformed through a dramatic, electrifying encounter. Lydia presented with Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, the slave girl encountering Jesus as a powerful deliverer, a mighty Savior. Recognize that the power then, as much as you see a great contrast, and yet the power that cast this evil spirit out of this girl is the same power that also opened up Lydia's heart. The power of Jesus Christ as Savior for both Lydia and this slave girl. These two ladies, these two females are brought to faith in Jesus Christ. And this is an incredible reminder that the gospel transforms an entire spectrum of people. Again, as F.F. F. Bruce said, the saving name of Jesus proved its power in the lives of the most diverse types. You and I also fit within this large, broad spectrum of people that are converted. Each of you possess a very beautiful testimony of Christ saving you. And many of you, perhaps even most of you, will not even remember a time that you did not know Jesus as a child of the covenant. Others may remember a very dramatic conversion like this young girl. Or others, a very quiet moment like Lydia. And yet in this very broad spectrum, we see the greatness of Christ's saving work for any and all. Which begs the question, is there anybody that now, today, you interact with whom you think that there's no way There's no way that person would ever come to Christ. Is there anyone, perhaps an unbelieving family member, perhaps an unbelieving friend, a dear friend, perhaps a co-worker, perhaps someone, an acquaintance that you know, a person who has fallen away from church, Do we give up thinking that there is no way the gospel can open up this person's heart? There's no way the power of Christ can open that person's heart. That person whose heart is too hard, that person is too cold. Is there anyone that you sit here today and say, you know what, it's just not going to happen, so why bother? And you give up. People of God, we are called here. And we see this great godly example follow Paul's lead here. Follow the example set forth by Paul, Silas, and Timothy as they rely upon God. It is not in the power of Paul's name, but it is in the power of the name of Jesus. It is the power of Jesus Christ that opens up Lydia's heart. It is the power of Jesus Christ that casts out this demon from this slave girl. It is the power of Christ. And so rely upon the power of Christ. Do not rely upon yourselves and see then the unthinkable happen as Christ opens these hearts and minds up. Call upon Jesus to save. Call upon the power of Jesus' name. Call upon Jesus as Savior. But there's a problem here. right? Jesus as Savior can be ever so Because if Jesus is my Savior, it also means Jesus is my Lord. There is no, I accept Jesus as my Savior today, and one day later in the future, I will accept Him as my Lord. 
doesn't work like that. He is my Savior and He is my Lord. It is one in the same. By saving you, by freeing you, by delivering you, the gospel also removes what is functioning in your life as Lord. If it is not Jesus Christ, the gospel removes what is functioning in your life, in your heart, as Lord. And so you see, as the gospel confronts this community of people, while it may have freed this young slave girl, as it comes to this community of people, what do they do? See, rather than rejoice, rather than rejoice that the power of Jesus delivered this slave girl, these slave owners and their friends, angry, fearful that they have lost what is most precious in their life. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not something that they rejoice over, but rather something that they become angry, even responding violently that they want nothing to do with the saving work of Jesus. See, ironically, the spirit of Python may have enslaved this little girl, but it's clear that these slave owners are the ones who are enslaved by a spirit of something else. Be it a spirit of greed, be it a spirit of power, a spirit of manipulation, a spirit where they are controlled by what they long and love to serve the most. You see, that's something we need to understand because we are controlled by something in our life. We are all enslaved to something in our life. We all serve something. We all live for something. We all will do anything for it. You see, that thing, that is your Lord. See, there's a very famous song, and I think this person hits it on the nail. There's a very famous song from the 70s. Some of you may be familiar with it. Some of you may not be. It's a famous song by one of, perhaps one of the greatest lyricists ever, Bob Dylan. And he wrote a song called Gotta Serve Somebody. And in the refrain, he writes, but you're going to have to serve somebody, yes indeed. You're going to have to serve somebody, well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. See, think of it like this, if you live for personal approval, for the approval of others, then you're going to be controlled by the people whose love you crave the most. If you live for power, if that's really the thing that matters to you most in life, then you're going to be enslaved by the need to control and determine the outcome. You're not going to want to rely on anyone else. You will do certain things that will keep you in power, keep you having and retaining that power and control. Or say you live for financial gain. Will you forego honesty and integrity so long as you keep the scales, you tip the scales in your favor? Is it status? Is it reputation? Will you lie and deceive just so that you could look a certain way so that no one will see you for what you are? Again, maybe it's good things in your life? Is your family the Lord of your life? Is your spouse, your romance, the Lord of your life? That you will do anything, whatever they ask, you will do anything and sacrifice anything for it. So again, let me ask you, who or what in your life 
are you serving? And have those things enslaved you? Do they control you that you can't live without it? Is there anything that you need so much that it would wreck you? That if you lost it. And if you can identify those things, well, that is your Lord. But understand that when Paul comes to this young girl, we're reminded that Jesus comes as your Savior and as your Lord to break, to break you free from whatever, from whatever you might be under bondage to, to whatever you might have become enslaved to, to whatever you might have become addicted to. Our Lord Jesus Christ sets you free from all of it. The power of Jesus' name brings you deliverance as your Savior so that you can be freed from the lords of this world and the spirit of slavery that brings fear. Listen to what Paul will write much later on in life from Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For you, Christian, for you, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. How incredible that you have been given this freedom with the spirit of God dwelling in you. You have been given this freedom. This freedom. That came at a cost for Jesus. The ontological Son of God. It came at a cost for Him. See, you became free because He became bound to the cross. He died being bound to death. He became sin who knew no sin so that you might become the righteousness of God. Through His death then, and only through His death, to free you from death by crushing the head of the serpent. The spirit of Python was allowed to bruise His heel. Jesus is the Lord of lords, the King of kings. Whereas these slave owners dehumanize this young girl. Jesus Christ frees you so that you might truly be human. Truly be what God created you to be. So that you might enter a very real relationship with God where you are valued and embraced by your Lord and Savior. You're not used for personal gain, for personal greed, for personal selfishness. But you are cherished and relished by your beloved God. This is the Savior's love for you. This is the love of your Lord Jesus. And unless Jesus is the real Lord of your life, The one that you get up for. The one that the last thought on your mind as you go to bed. The one that you truly live for. The one that is the love of your life. You will find yourself living in fear and enslaved to all these other things. Let me end with what we're reminded by God with Galatians chapter 5. In verse 1, Paul again writes, For freedom, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You have been freed to love God and to love your neighbor. Let us 
shed all these things that entangle us. Let us remove those things that entangle us. That as we have set apart our Lord, our Savior, first and foremost in our hearts, that in this way we might be free to love Him and free to love one another. Let's pray. Father in heaven, There are so many things in this world that are competing for our hearts. There are so many things that are competing for our attention. But none of these things were able to save us. None of these things could deliver us. None of these things could truly free us. That we might be what we were made to be. None of these things are able to give us a sense of completion, a sense of wholeness. We chase after all these other things and we serve them. We give our lives for it. We give our lives to the rat race. We give our lives to do anything and everything for these false lords that we set up in our lives. But we ask, O oh God, as you've redeemed us, you've saved us, you are our Savior, our Deliverer. Because of that, because we have been freed, we have been freed to serve you. We have been freed to love you, to love our neighbor. May this fill our hearts. May our mind not grow cold. May our heart not grow cold. You have transformed this heart of stone into a heart of flesh, a heart that feels, a heart that loves. Oh God, thank you for your transforming work in our lives. May we give to you our heart, our soul, our mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.